All right, I started recording. So um, thank you everyone uh, for showing up today and uh, attending the tutoring session. I appreciate y'all. Uh, and um, I also really appreciate if y'all watch it at home later as well. So today we are going to cover GI nursing care. This is the last chapter uh, in the exam three that will be covered. Um, so exam three will be covering um, cardiac, neuro and GI, uh, I think, and musculoskeletal, yeah. Uh, so hopefully this uh, will give you guys uh, enough information uh, to prepare uh, for class tomorrow. So GI, what is GI? Gastrointestinal, so anything from the mouth all the way up until um, the anus is uh, covered in GI, okay? So um, the common diagnostic study help to know if the patient is having good nutrition in GI is albumin. So if the question asking you guys, which lab should a nurse consider to look at uh, for the patient uh, that is experiencing nutritional deficit, then you guys would pick albumin, okay? So I think the level of the albumin, the normal level of the albumin is uh, anywhere between uh, three to five, yeah? Uh, and then we take a look at total protein. So total protein is uh, more specific, uh, but rarely seen because it's very, an very, it is an, a very expensive test. But when the patient has uh, a really severe nutrition imbalance, uh, when they are like really malnourishing, uh, they pull this total protein test in order to, to assess um, the, the, the situation of the patient, the status of the patient nutritional wise. All right, let's move on. So GI system, GI system, it core function is to break down food, of course, we eat the food in, we want to, the food to be broken down, uh, and then uh, they have inc increases the surface area of the food to the, the micro villi in our stomach so that these villi will be able to absorb the nutrients. Uh, the GI system also helps to eliminate waste product that we put on after we eat the food. Example, uh, so when we take care of our patient and they have some GI issues such as nausea and vomiting uh, or chronic diarrhea, the good diagnostic study tests that we do uh, are either upper GI series or a lower GI series, okay? So upper GI series are including like anything uh, from the stomach and above and lower GI series is anything from the small intestine and below. All right, so upper GI series. So when we talk about upper GI series, we do something called endoscopies. So look, remember it's upper, so it start with an E and then E stands for esophagus. They will start putting an endos endoscope uh, through your mouth into the esophagus and into the stomach to visualize a, um, to, is there any ulcers in the stomach, okay? So that's, that's called upper GI series and they are endoscopy. So if the patient having stomach pain, we do endoscopy to visualize if there's any ulcers or bleeding that's going on in that stomach, which causing the pain. Uh, example, maybe patient continues to vomit, aspirate, difficult swallow, uh, so much pain after eating food. So we would do an, an endoscopy. Uh, sphincter issues um, is uh, occur due to the sphincter may not close completely. This allow acid to come back up to the esophagus. So when we eat food, uh, the food will go from the mouth into the esophagus and into the stomach. So between the, the connection of the esophagus and the stomach, there's a sphincter. This sphincter is supposed to be closed when, um, supposed to be closed when after we eat, right? So only, it only open for the food to go down into the stomach, but it closed so that the food and the stomach contents does not regurgitate it back into the esophagus because we uh, because if that happens that we will have a sphincter issues and this will also allow the acid from the stomach to go back up to the esophagus. That's when we have something called GERD, 
uh, gastrointestinal reflux. And we don't want that because over time, an excessive regurgitation of the acid from the stomach can cause erosion of the esophagus and can cause esophagus or throat cancers and um, all of these horrible uh, side effects that causes damage to the esophagus, okay? Um, if there's an acid issues, the sphincter is not closed completely, there will be acid in the esophagus, like I mentioned earlier. Um, the endoscop in endoscopy, endoscopy will visualize how back up it is and how bad the lining is being erosion and breakdown. Okay, so because it's in the esophagus, so that's why it's upper, upper GI series. Okay, endoscopy is the procedure. Remember the E, E stands for esophagus, so that means that it's upper. All right, now that we covered the upper, so now we have to know how to prepare the patient for an upper GI series. So these patients have to be NPO, nothing by mouth for about eight hours. Um, teach them what are going to happen. Uh, so that we, the first thing that we teach these patients that they are not able to eat right after the procedure. The reason is because an endoscopy is going from the mouth into the esophagus. So this, uh, in order for this procedure to happen, the, the physician will have to spray the throat uh, the, 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 and numb the gag reflex. So they spray the, the, the throat with lidocaine uh, and this will cause this numbness of the throat. And when there's a numbness of the throat, there will be a uh, risk for aspiration if the patient start eating. Um, so because they numb the, they, they need to numb the throat in order for the endoscopy to be go through the patient's esophagus without them vomiting and causing um, obstruction or anything like that. Um, so what do we expect? Also some medication that give, is given that can make the patient drowsy this procedure as well. So no need to have a swallow test before they can eat again, but if they have the gag reflex back, they can eat patient can swallow their saliva. So what that means is obviously because they cannot eat right afterward because then the throat just got numb by the lidocaine. However, that's why post-op the nurse going to have to assess this patient uh, continuously, usually after a few hours when the patient able to swallow their saliva and um, they are uh, able to, to, to drink some water, then um, they can start uh, eating normally again. Uh, complication for endoscopy is aspiration. Uh -huh. So aspiration is uh, they eat right away when they get reflect is still numb and the food, instead of going to the esophagus, it goes to the trachea and causes a uh, airway obstruction in the trachea and therefore lead to aspiration. Next, we have lower GI series. So lower GI series is colonoscopy. So opposite with the endoscopy, the lower the, the colonoscopy uh, visualize the, instead of the esophagus and the stomach, it's the colonoscopy visualize the colon, the small intestine, the large intestine, and the rectum area, okay? So for this procedure, we have to teach the patient to use a, medicate, uh, a medicated fluid that name go lightly. So this fluid is a very potent laxative fluid that is used to clear the bowel, bowel prior to undergoing uh, and colonoscopy. I'm sorry, this is a colonoscopy, not colonoscopy, not an endoscopy, okay? This part. So go lightly is a very potent laxative used to clear the bowel prior undergoing a colonoscopy. The reason why we need to uh, the, 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 the bowel to be clear because colonoscopy is like a camera, a very tiny camera that is go down into the small intestine and visualize the, uh, the, the structure of the intestine and visualize if there are any ulcers or any uh, pouches in the intestine uh, or any bleeding in the intestine. That's, so that's why we want the intestine to be clear so that this camera can be can look at all these, um, everything. 
if the, 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 the small intestine is full of stool and is not clean, then um, it will be very hard for, uh, for, 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 for the doctor to see and it will not be as effective. They, won't, they will miss um, an ulcer or something like that. So that's why the bowel have to be completely clean and clear when um, the patient is going through colonoscopy. So go lightly, it makes the bowel go. Uh, and so basically it's a laxative that have electrolytes in it. Um, so it is a thickened liquid prescribed as a, a gallon. So these patients have to drink a whole one gallon like the night before of the uh, lower GI series. So they start drinking the night before around six o'clock the night before of the procedure. They drink as much as tolerated. Um, how do we, uh, how does the nurse effect, uh, evaluate the effectiveness of this, um, uh, this fluid? Uh, they have to see clear liquid, liquid coming out of the stool. There's no, there cannot be no stool or chunks when this patient poop. So if this is not effective, what do we have to do? So the nurse assess the patient and if the patient still having uh, fluid that is stalls or chunks inside there when they, they, they go to the restroom, then that is not effective and the nurse have to do enemas until this patient is completely clean and clear. So because, so because, um, because this, causes, this is a laxative, it causes the patient to poop a lot, so it can lead to hypotension and dehydration, okay? That makes sense, right? Because it lowers the volume in the body, and whenever there's a low volume in the body, it leads to lower the blood pressure and increases the high heart rate, and dehydration is because the patient losing a lot of fluid due to the poop, uh, due to the laxative. So after drinking the go lightly, patients should expect to have many bowel movements, water stool. They must make sure that when the patient comes to do the colonoscopy, the stuff coming out of the rectum must be cleared. If the patient is not cleared, the liquid comes out of the bowel, the nurse must do an anema. Need to be clear because need to visualize the bowel. Ask, did you do your prep? Is clear? when you go to the bathroom. If not, we must do enema until the fluid is clear. Complication again is dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, GI system, uh, excessive diarrhea, excessive vomiting, and always look at potassium and sodium. All right. So secondly, we have something called GERD. GERD is stand for gastric esophageal reflux disease. So basically that just means that acid from the stomach, the gastric will be regurgitated back into the esophagus. Uh, and yeah, so the patho is acid goes up to the esophagus due to poor sphincter control, uh, which allow the acid from stomach to come up. Problem with the sphincter is it's weak. Sign and symptom include patient will feel heartburn, pyrosis is another name for heartburn, chest pain. Sometimes the heartburn pain can radiate to the jaw and chest might feel tight. So it may confuse the patient with a heart attack. However, it's just a reflux factor from the esophagus. Risk factor for someone who have GERD include age, sphincter issues, spicy food, caffeine, chocolate, carbonated drink, acidic food, stressed. So spicy food and caffeine can really, really cause this GERD. How do we teach the patient to modify a, uh, any modifiable risk factor? Modifiable risk factor meaning that they can change. The risk factor, age, sphincter issues, uh, and so those are non-modifiable. Modifiable, including the diet. The patient can avoid spicy food if they know that when they eat spicy food, they can have GERD and they need to avoid fat food, caffeinated drink, uh, and also acidic food. Acidic food, what are acidic food? Those are like uh, tomatoes. Uh, those are like um, oranges. So those are acidic food. 
Um, so we have to tell them that we, they have to sit up after eating. They cannot finish their dinner and go and lie on the couch or lie on the bed immediately. That will cause us the reflux of acid back to the esophagus. So no, no lying down after eating. And then they have to eat slower, eat smaller meals, and they have to stop smoking. Smoking is really bad for the body. It causes facial constriction and it leads to a lot of sphincter weakened issues. Um, so not only we don't we should not smoke, but also we have to avoid people who 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 avoid the area where people who smoke because secondary smoking can also lead to these issues as well. All right. So tomato sauce, because tomato is really high in acidic, so um, it can cause us acid reflux. Alcohol increases acid production. And when there are more acid in the body, there will be increases the chance for it to be refluxed back. Um, avoid lifting and straining because this can weaken sphincter. So job that require heavy lifting or like um, a lot of um, uh, put up, or like, uh, yeah, just lifting and straining in general can, can lead to weakened sphincter. Um, never have milk the night before bed because acid can boil the milk inside the stomach and curdle it, and the patient will wake up with a horrible nausea and vomiting. So do not give milk before bed for, or do not drink milk before bed. Avoid chocolate. Chocolate has a high level of uh, caffeine and sugar, so therefore it can lead to um, acid reflux as well. Elevate head of the bed 30 degree will be a, uh, a good uh, thing for the to do for the patient after they eat so that uh, gravity-wise, it will not cause this reflux too much on the body. And of course, not lying down for two to three hours after the meal. Uh, bed blocks include putting pillows um, to lay up at night to aid for digestions. All right, next we move on to intervention for GERD. Again, so we sit the patient up, give them small meals, give them antacid. If you guys watch my, um, my medication quiz already, then you guys will know this medication, uh, antacid. So antacid is basically a medication that will neutralize the acid. It will decrease the pH of the acid of the acid in the uh, stomach. So we cannot take antacids and normal medication at the same time because it will neutralize the other medication as well. So it will decrease the effectiveness of that medications. So we must teach the patient how to time to get the drug. So we take the drug after the meal because the food create acid and antacid neutralize it. We should not give antacid before meal because there's no acid to neutralize. We have to eat first so that the, the stomach produces acid and then we can give antacid to neutralize the acid and prevent GERD. Proton pump inhibitors, no need to time with other medication. Long-term use of PPI, can cause bone fractures, weaken bone down the road. And an example of PPI include um, a, a prilosec, which is omeprazole. All right, next we have something called hiatal hernia. So this is also a sphincter issues, uh, which causes acid to back up as well. So it's similar to GERD. However, the difference is in the, patho the pathologies. With hiatal hernia, the diaphragm weakens allow the stomach to slide up, all right? So we have our lungs and then our diaphragm. And then below the diaphragm is the stomach. So the, st the, the diaphragm is weakened, so it leave a little hole that the, the, a portion of the stomach is slide up into the, the lung cavity. And this will push its acid into the esophagus as well. So the problem here is the diaphragm weaken. Whereas in GERD, the problem is, the sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach weaken, all right? So please make sure that you guys know the difference between them. Symptoms of hiatal hernia is, sometimes it can be asymptomatic, meaning there's nothing that show that the patient have hiatal hernia, uh, or the patient can have heartburn. It can be either sitting or standing and they still having heartburn. Uh, Patient also have problem with swallowing too. Unlike GERD, 
which is a sphincter problem with too much acid production and causes heartburn. Hernia is a weakened diaphragm, which causes heartburn and issues with swallowing. Okay, so hiatal hernia is also causes issue with swallowing as well, which is dysphagia. Intervention, same intervention as GERD, but patient with hiatal hernia uh, also have issue with dysphagia. Yeah, I literally said that. So when someone having an, a risk for dysphagia, a risk for aspiration, which is diff or difficulties swallowing like dysphagia, uh, we have to modify their diet. We have to thicken the fluid that they, that they drink. So instead of giving them just uh, clear water, we can give them Ensure, which is a thickened um, nutritional fluid uh, that contain um, a lot of uh, nutrition in it. Uh, sit the patient upright, small bite of food and no straw because um, it's easier for the patient to drink uh, than uh, without straw than drink with a straw because we drink with the straw, it can directly go into uh, down the throat and maybe go into the trachea. So, and sometimes it causes a lot of difficulty for people who are having dysphagia. So no straw for these patients. If we don't do anything and have a lot of acid reflux, eventually this will lead to erosions. This will da wear down the lining of the esophagus, stomach, and then lead to gastritis, all right? All right, so we just talk about gastritis. So basically gastritis is acid wear down the mucosa. There will be redness spot indicate lining is breaking down. The patient is at the tipping point of bursting and causing GI bleed. It's stage two right now, but if it moves to stage three, it can cause bleeding and die quickly. So redness spot in the lining of the stomach um, are stage one of gastritis. And this is caused because the acid in the stomach is too strong that causes um, breaking down of this lining. And if it moves to stage two, these patients will be increasing risk for that area to be burst and causes a GI bleed inside the stomach. The goal is to avoid the red spot, which is stage one from going to stage two uh, and then move to peptic ulcer disease. Peptic ulcer disease is stage three, okay? So peptic ulcer disease is acid keep up with wearing the the acid keep wearing down the mucosa and turn into a state three ulcers um, in the stomach or esophagus, okay? So remember the stage one is there's only redness spot. The stage two, it's more severe and this patient are at risk for bleeding. And stage three is the peptic ulcer disease. Um, so ultimately uh, peptic ulcer disease, it can lead to per perforate bowel and GI bleeds. So perforate bowel, meaning there'll be a hold in the bowel and the blood which is coming out. And that means that the, the ulcer is so bad. Uh, etiology is infection like H. pylori could contribute to PUD, peptic ulcer disease. If you guys take microbiology, you guys probably know about H. pylori already. So this is a bacteria that can cause peptic ulcer disease. Lifestyle, too much stress, wrong food can also lead to PUD. If we keep continuing eating hot Cheetos every day or eating spicy food every day, then it, we can have gastritis and eventually lead to PUD. Um, certain medication can also cause um, peptic ulcer disease. Uh, some medication that increases the acid production can lead to this problem, um, but you don't have to know. Um, assessment findings include, so it's same assessment finding as gastritis. So basically this patient will have GERD, uh, but the only difference is they don't have the dysphagia that uh, similarly to the hiatal hernia. Hiatal hernia is the only one that can cause dysphagia. All right, let's move on. Clinical manifestation of someone who have PUD, peptic ulcer disease, Sometimes they just asymptomatic. Then there's bleeds and then epigastric pain, back pain. They can have dull, aching, burning pain. Depends on the meal was ingested, digested. They can have heartburn, nausea, vomiting. Melena is a 
black terry stool that these patients also may have. That just means that the stool contain blood and that's not good. Uh, coffee ground emesis, that means that they're, 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 they're vomiting, their throw up contains uh, a brown color like coffee. So that means that uh, there's some GI bleed in the upper belly that coagulate and the patient got nauseated. Seasonal trends like allergy, that's why we give histamine 2 receptor to some patient to help with the allergy that causes with the acid productions. There are two types of peptic ulcer disease, and depending on the location, it makes it either gastric or duodenal ulcers. This when the peptic ulcer keep erodes and lead to the ulcers. So gastric ulcers and duodenal ulcer, you have to know the difference between this, okay? These are two types of peptic ulcer disease. The first type is gastric ulcer. When we read the name, we immediately already can tell that this ulcer located in the stomach. Gastric is stomach. So gastric stomach, so the stomach comes first before the colon, obviously, uh, and is upper in the GI tract. So the pain with eating happens sooner. So when the patient eat, like the pain will be present about 30 to one hour after meal. The food will make the pain worse because the food go directly to the stomach. So it makes the pain worse and it can irritate the stomach. So this will make the patient eat less and the patient who have a gastric ulcer, usually they can have weight loss, burning and nausea and vomiting compared to duodenal ulcers. So when we breathe the duodenal ulcer, we immediately know that this ulcer is located in the small intestine, correct? So because the small intestine comes after the stomach, so the pain is usually about two to three hours after the food compared to 30 to one hour after the food, like the gastric ulcers. With duodenal ulcer, the food can relieve and make the hurt burn or dull pain feel better. So actually eating will make the pain feel better in duodenal ulcer. Uh, and this will make the patient want to eat more so that they can feel better and don't feel as much pain. So that's why these patients are usually gaining more weight. Uh, however, they still have some burning and nausea and vomiting sensation. So that's the difference between duodenal and gastric. Next, we move on to intervention for PUD. So PUD, peptic ulcer disease patients, will have an acid reflux issues that causes them to have an ulcer that bleeds. Patient put on NPO, when the patient don't eat, they don't produce acid, all right? So we put this patient on nothing by mouth so that the stomach doesn't produce any acid. We put the patient on NG tube suction intermittently. So that there will be an NG tube go into the stomach and suction out the acid that is produced. Uh, so this allow the stomach to rest and heal. And we put the patient on IV fluid to hydrate the patient and obviously stop smoking. The biggest complication for peptic ulcer disease is hemorrhagic. Hemorrhagic is bleeding. Uh, coffee ground emesis is um, vomit that contains blood. Black terry stool is poop that contains blood. Um, so that's what's when the ulcer has worn away so much that it causes bleeding. Uh, the other complication of PUD is perforation. So this is the most lethal complication. Why? The reason is because perforation causes leaking of the stomach into the peritoneum, like the content of the stomach, the food, the broken down food, the acid will lead, lead to the peritoneum area. And also poop can leak leaks to the peritoneum area as well. And the patient can have septicemia and death. That's when the patient is in sepsis because there's so much bacteria uh, that is being leaked to the peritoneum of the body. Both are considered emergency situations. Perforation will lead to an emergency surgery because risk of septicemia. 
Next, we have sign symptom of perforation. So perforation, like I said, again, is there's literally a hole in the stomach that the skin is broken down so much that it creates a hole and everything will comes out that holes into the peritoneum. So this patient will have persistent pain, pain that is so constant and nothing relieves the pain. They will have no bowel movement because it all the, all the poop and all the food goes out of that hole. There's nothing go down to the colon or the rectum so, so that the patient can poop. This patient will have fever and this is indicated a late sign because the gut is already infected, rotten, which lead to infection and sepsis. Uh, they will have sudden dramatic onset, pain spread all over the abdomen, tachycardia, weak pose because perfusion does not go to gut. They will have rigid, board-like abdomen muscle because of the feces, gas, and all of the things. No bowel sound because the motility is absent. And these patients will have nausea and vomiting because the stool is backing up, leading to vomit. All right, that's perforation. Now we're going to go covering the inflammatory bowel disease. So there's two types of inflammatory bowel disease. These are ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. I think we all heard a lot of commercial talking about ulcerative and Crohn's disease. So let's learn about this today. So basically, these are, these are inflammatory bowel disease. These causes the gut to get very inflamed and irritated. And there's, there's no reason to explain it. Some patients just, it's, it's just cause there's no reason, idiopathic. Because of this irritation of the gut, it go, the guts go into hyperdrive, um, which is the natural response from the GI tract when it's inflamed is to poop. So it speed up the pooping process. So these patients can have up to 20 bowel movement a day. Uh, so the body trying to speed up and expel all of the, um, the content inside the stomach or the intestine. The big complication is obviously dehydration. These patients poop up to 20 times a day. Obviously, they're going to get dehydrated. They can get fluid volume deficit and electrolyte imbalance. For this patient, we do not give food because their, their gut is in hyperdrive. If we give food to them, it's just going to come in, come out, come in, come out. It does not retain anything, and it's even causes more irritation to the body. So we don't give food for ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Um, we don't use enteral tubing as well because enteral tubing is basically just a tube go directly to the stomach. So the gut still have to work to mod. What we use is we use TPN or PPN. These are total parental food. This is basically nutrition that go to the IV instead of going to the stomach. So the two type is, the, the first is ulcerative colitis. This happened at the top of the descending colon. Remember, we have ascending transverse and descending colon. So this is the, 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 the large intestine, right? So it's happened at the top of the descending colon. The main problem are bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain. Different between the UC and the Crohn disease are tenemus and rectal bleeding. These are two specific to uh, ulcerative colitis. So tenemus is the feeding that you need to pass stool, even though your bowel are already um, empty. Like these patients always feel like, oh my God, I still need to poop. And I feel like pooping, but they sit in the restroom for like hours and there's nothing can come out. Um, and also it may involve straining and pain and cramping, all right? So sensation of incomplete bowel evacuation, incomplete and deficit of fluid volume. All right, now we move on to prone disease. This happens sporadically through the whole large intestine compared to ulcerative colitis where it happened at the top of the descending colon, okay? And then... Um, a uh, common in Crohn's disease is diarrhea, abdominal cramping, and rectal bleeding, sometimes occurring Crohn's disease, although not as often as in ulcerative colitis. All right. Etiology is 
well, like I mentioned earlier, there's not a really main reason for this to happen, but these are both autoimmune disease. So what it means is that the body attacking the gut itself. So it can be an infected process, an agent causes, there's many causes to this. Or also NSAIDs can cause this, which is aspirin, ibuprofen, or allergies can cause this as well. Assessment of um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease include uh, diarrhea. These patients poop a lot. They have a lot of diarrhea in a day. Dehydration due to diarrhea, the patient could die because up to 20 bowel movement a day, who can survive? Blood will have blood, bloody stools. They will have loose volume, hypovolema, anemic. They will have weight loss. The patient don't want to eat. No nutrients absorbed due to diarrhea. This patient will have fever due to a gut is splitting. The skin is open. Uh, fatigue because they are anemic. They have low level of blood. The blood is lost. Malnutrition, not absorbing anything. They will have folic acid, anemia iron. The patient can have up to 20 days, times a day diarrhea, bloody diarrhea, and this can lead to anemia, tachycardia, low blood pressure, hypovolemic shock, abdominal pain, fever, and dehydration. How do we fix this? We fix it by giving them fluid. Obviously, fluid first, fluid fast, whenever they experience hypovolemic shock. We, use, we stop the inflammatory response by using antidiarrheals, uh, but sometimes it does not fix this problem. So what we do is we use steroids because it uh, can um, suppress the inflammatory process. However, like I said, steroid is a very toxic medication. It can cause a lot of issues with weakening the bone, increasing the blood sugars, and also uh, put the patient in a um, uh, risk for infection um, state. So that's why it should be used on and off. It should not be used all the time. And also we can use some immune suppression from the biologic therapy. All right, now that we know about the inflammatory process, we're going to cover diverticular disease. So diverticular disease is also known as diverticulosis and diverticulitis. So it's opposite with ulcerative or Crohn disease. This is not an inflammatory bowel disease. It's not an inflammatory problem. It does not cause diarrhea. It causes constipation. This is when our pouches of the colon, these pouches got full of poop, and this can cause infection, peritonitis, wear a waste, rot, perforation. All right? So why does this happen? This happened because some people, they are so constipated that, this is the intestine and they're so constipated, they cannot poop. And when they poop, they straining so hard that it causes this little pouch. This is a little pouch outside of the, 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 the intestine, the large intestine and the poop, instead of it's go down straight, it can go into these pouches and get stuck there. And over time, if the poop gets stuck there and it does not get out, it can cause infection and it can eat away the patient's skin, eat away the patient's intestine and cause us perforation and lead to sepsis and bleeding and all this kind of this nasty stuff, right? So, so this is, again, this is not an inflammatory disease. This is not a, um, a diarrheal disease. This is a constipation disease. So, um, goal is for the nurse to keep everything, trying to keep doing everything so that the patient does not get constipated. This patient, um, because uh, we must keep them from constipation by giving them more fibers, more waters, tell them to start walking, good mobility. We do not give them seeds. You know, you guys know why? Because seeds, um, they can't, they, sometimes they're not being digested by the body and then it just get pooped out. But in some cases in this patient, because it does not get digested, so this seat can cause irritation of this, the stomach lining or the intestine or causes stretch and lead to more, even more, um, more worse uh, situation. So basically the goal for diverticular disease are to prevent constipation, get the patient poop, 
giving them water, giving them fiber, and prevent infection, peritonitis, and perforation. All right, so earlier I mentioned about parenteral disease, especially it should be used for patients who have inflammatory bowel disease. So parenteral nutrition, parenteral nutrition is the last effort. This is when we have tried everything uh, because parenteral nutrition is through the bloodstream, the IV, the patient must have a central line. A central line is a line where they, uh, where they um, insert it directly into a subclavian uh, artery or subclavian vein or something like that. Uh, and it's go through a bigger vascular system and it stay there for a longer time. Uh, TPN has a lot of electrolyte, insulin, fat, and sugars. It's so sugary. It's horrible. It's just really packed with a lot of sugars. Uh, so that's why we it is a last resource because it's go through the patient vein. Um, so it's have high risk, high risk of infection, and plus the extra sugar, so it increases the risk of infection dramatically. So, so that's why the, the patient who on parenteral nutrition, we have to monitor them very carefully. For non-diabetic patient that's on TPN, we must check the finger stick, meaning check the glucose blood level uh, every six hours compared to a diabetic patient where we check every four hours and also before meals and at that time, ACHS. For a non-diabetic patient, we give them insulin when their sugar is high. Um, so these patients will on a mild sliding scale of insulin. For example, if the blood sugar is 155, they get two to three units of insulin. Compared to a diabetic patient, they will be put on a more aggressive sliding scale. Example, the same if they get 155 glucose blood level, they'll get five units instead of two to three units like a non-diabetic patient. Okay. So complication of TPN, total parenteral nutrition, is hyperglycemia, meaning increased sugar in the blood. That makes sense, right? I just mentioned that there's so much sugar in the solution, right? So if we pull this drug and we take it off too abruptly, meaning we stop the drug like immediately and too abruptly, it can lead to hypoglycemia because the body is constantly receiving high sugar contained and then we suddenly stop, then the body already secreted so much insulin that if we stop this, the, the, the solution immediately and abruptly, this insulin will be flowing in the blood and causes hypoglycemia of this patient. So in order to avoid sign symptom of hypoglycemia, we have to slow down the rate of the TPN slowly when we take them off, we taper them off. For example, we dial to half a rate, then half a rate 30 minutes later. So all the time we have to look for signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia when we tapering off this medication. Cold and clammy is a sign of hypoglycemia. All right, so we did it, Sky. Uh, we finished the GI chapters. Uh, obviously, there are like a few medication that you guys need to know for this chapter. So I recommend you guys go to the medication quiz that I made and watch it. Um, but that's it for today. Um, is there any question or anything that you guys would like to ask? I will post this as soon as it's available on YouTube. So if you guys miss any part, you guys can come back and look at it. But yeah, overall, it's a pretty straightforward chapter. Um, you're very welcome. Thank you so much, guys, for coming in. If you guys don't have any questions, feel free to live, leave. I mean, yeah. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. All right, come on. Pop.